Okay, I'm going to try to record three things at one time. Nobody has joined our meeting, so it's this one. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is 4.30. Uh, we have all members on board. Thank you. Plus, honored guest, Ms. Rosenberg. Um, and so uh, I will call the meeting to order of Park and Recreation Committee of the City of Wausau for Monday, August 3, and begin with public comment or suggestions. Uh, Mr. Frickenstein is with us to talk about the tree removal appeal, uh, but he is opting to uh, speak uh, when we get to that topic. So I don't see any other public comment. Um, ask for a motion on the minutes or any uh, comments or questions, concerns. Motion to approve from Neil, second by Watson. No questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Um, Jamie can lead us through the September meeting date issue. Um, I'm wondering if we could just do the next day, but. Um, yes, so thank you. Uh, so I was looking at the calendar when I always set the agenda and noticed that our next meeting falls on uh, Labor Day. So um, unless the council wants to meet on Labor Day, uh, staff is not working that day. So. Um, I, have, I looked at the city's calendar for other meetings that were taking place. These were two suggestions I had. If the committee comes up with a different date, we can look at that as well. Um, but I picked on here Tuesday, the September 8th, which would be the following day. There is a city finance committee meeting, which is scheduled for 5.15 p.m. Um, or we could do it the following Monday and keep it on a Monday. Um, but there is a human uh, resources committee scheduled from 4.30 to 5.30, so we could either meet before, a little earlier, or meet after on that following Monday as well. Would September 8 at 4 p.m. work? Uh, I don't know how many people are gainfully employed. Is 4 <laughs> o'clock okay on September 8th? So before the Finance Committee meeting? And then we can, we'd have an hour and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. We could handle that. Very good. Are we just agreed on that? Mm -hmm. Very can good. We have can we have a motion actually on that? Would you like a motion on that? Yes, please, because then we'll start. Seeking a motion on setting our meeting for 4 p.m. on September 8th. Mr. Neal is moving. Mr. Killian, I caught him out of my corner of my eye. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Very much. Thank you. Major passes. And we have a tree removal appeal for 1720 North First Avenue. Uh, you've had information in your packet um, about that situation. Uh, I just drove up there to see it for myself, uh, but to kick off the conversation, uh, have Mr. or Mrs. or both of them, Frickenstein, uh, speak to us about the request. If you'd like to come up. I do want to mention, too, that uh, Mr. Andy Sims is our city forester is here as well to answer any questions after. You just need to identify yourself for the record and give us your address. Right here? Okay. Yep. Gerald Frickenstein and my wife, Mary Kay, we lived here at <clears throat> this address at 1720 for 45 years. The street was put in the, the day after we <laughs> moved in, I guess. Anyhow, uh, I don't know when the trees were put in there, but uh, these basswood trees that were 
along our lot in the adjoining lot, Doug Blooms, they've reached their age limit, I feel, we feel. And you, and you uh, probably noticed that because of the way the root base is coming out of the ground. It's got a big mound by the curb. It blocks drainage from the lots between our lot and Doug Bloom's lot. The drainage that was designed there when we built it to have a, like not like a ditch but a, a drop off so the water could get out without running across the driveway. That does not happen anymore because of this huge root base. The roots also are coming over into our, our grass and our flower garden. And uh, we also have a real dangerous situation here because of the tree size. The tree size is probably over 24 inches in diameter and it's five feet from our driveway. So when you back out of this driveway, you gotta look through a solid wood base, way up, whatever. Anyhow, uh, we're on a dangerous street because we have over 600 cars a day on this street. North First Avenue is a very used street because of the apartments Monk Gardens or Monk uh, Crabtree. There's 42 individual units there, and many, many people have two cars. So there's a lot of traffic going through there. And we did have a stop sign put up, Boss Creek, a few years back because of the speeding coming down the hill to try and re remedy that. But like Dave Nutting said, when we got the stop sign, he says, yeah, now all we got to do is try to get him to stop. And he was right. And uh, I've called just about every spring, police department to have them come over and put a radar up and determine that. This is where I got the information about 600 cars a day, 3,600 a week, and 2% a day. 2% of that 600 are speeders over 40 miles an hour on a residential street. It's about 1,000 feet from Boss Creek up to Campus Drive. So it's like a drag race when they leave the stop sign or if they even don't even stop through it, they race, okay? It's very, very fast street. Anyhow, uh, which is with this tree here blocking the line of sight coming out of my driveway for myself, my wife, and any visitors, family that come. The one on the, on the next block, at Doug, on the next lot at Doug Bloom's, they took one of them out because it was rotten in the middle. And now the other one is coming out also because of the same situation. This one here may not have that internal rot until you cut it down and look at it. But anyhow, it's a dangerous tree. And adjoining this tree are my mailbox and Doug Bloom's mailbox. So when you back out of my driveway, you got 48 inches that are blocked off because of the tree and two mailboxes. And the mailboxes, you know, are not small anymore. They're big plastic things. So all I'm asking is, to have this dangerous tree removed from the street. And the forester knows about how much of a mess it makes. You want to see a mess, you should go up on the top of the hill by Grebe's Church and see the line of basswood trees there that have got the garbage in the street. It's unbelievable. And we've put up with that now for 40 years of all the branches, all the leaves, the mess that comes down, the seeds, they give seeds off. So all that ends up in the street, and then it ends up in your driveway, and it ends up in your garage, in your house. So I just request that this thing be removed and 
I wouldn't care one thing if you didn't put anything smaller like you did on the next lot for Doug. I don't think I need one because I have an ash tree that is probably within 12 feet of that. And I have a oak, large oak tree in my front yard. So I have plenty of shade and trees. But this one here should go because it's a dangerous tree on a dangerous street. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we could hear from uh, Forrester Sims on his thinking on this, which is, I guess, identical to the thinking of his predecessor. Sure. Sorry, my first time, so I think I have to turn the mic on. <laughs> um, so, yes, my predecessor um, had been called on this tree uh, on, on several occasions and instructed the arborist to lift the tree, um, lifting being uh, raising it over the roadway and over the driveway and uh, over the yard. And his assessment on the tree was it's in, in good condition and good health. Um, my assessment is the same, which is also in your packet. Uh, diameter of the tree is 21.3 inches. Something I would like to point out, um, we've got uh, roughly 2,500, I'm, I'm sorry, 2,500, and I'm doing it again, 25,500 trees in, uh, in the boulevards. And a tree this size, um, rough annual benefit is, is about $131, um, and that factors in uh, shade value and uh, stormwater retention, carbon sequestration, et cetera. So, um, you know, I just would like the committee to consider that. And the reason this came to, to committee is uh, Mr. Frickenstein contacted our department last fall with uh, the same request and we had spoken and I looked at uh, Mr. Bloom's property as well and uh, Mr. Frickenstein was correct. The uh, tree, one of the trees at Mr. Bloom's property had linden borer, which is, which is kind of typical as these trees mature that it's, a, it's an insect that does uh, damage those trees and, and render them uh, unsafe to be standing in the city. So we removed the one and subsequently have a marked and uh, going to remove the other one on Mr. Bloom's property. But these were for health reasons, uh, tree health reasons, not, uh, not for um, the visibility and obstruction that uh, Mr. Frickenstein speaks of. So my assessment of this tree is it in, is in good condition and good health. I don't see any signs of decay in the trunk. Um, not saying there isn't any. Uh, I did not core the tree, but uh, it's not exhibiting any, any signs that, that show me that it's in, uh, in threat of any, any kind of failure. Um, that being said, I, I guess I can't really speak to the, the, the water runoff that you had mentioned. Um, the, the root flare is typical of what a mature tree is. So, you know, they, trees don't come out of the crown, ground like a telephone pole. There, is a, uh, there are buttress roots that support that tree. And as the tree enlarges, it's, you know, those, those roots become more prevalent and, and raised. So um, that, is, that is factual, but I, I guess I can't speak to it, water going across the driveway uh, portion of your statement. Um, that being said, yeah, my, my professional opinion is the tree is in good health and good condition. Um, and I guess it would be to this committee to determine if the, uh, the safety hazard from coming out of the driveway uh, overrides that decision. What's your opinion on the safety hazard? Um, you know, having not backed out of your driveway. Um, you didn't? I, I, I didn't pull into your driveway. I walked into your driveway. So I, I never, I, I try not to pull into to private residence, you know, into driveways. I park on the roadway. Um, I, I see the tree there and, and I see the, um, you know, the mailboxes. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's less than two foot diameter tree, but I, I can see where you get to one point, a certain point in your driveway and that, that would potentially limit visibility. That being said, we've got multiple small trees in town that have wider crowns at, at that same height of visibility, which are also an obstruction. Mr. Larson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess my question would be is, you know, if the tree is healthy, why can't we move the mailboxes to make that intersection a little more, more safe to back out? I see in this picture here, yeah, the, if those mailboxes were out of there, that would probably, I, I haven't backed out of the driveway either. I, I, I can, I guess I'm torn each way on this, but if the mailboxes weren't there, that might solve half the problem. Yeah. Well, if you're sitting in a, in a car and you're backing out, the mailboxes, are, I think they're 42 inches is the standard height to the bottom. 
So the box is probably eight inches tall. So uh, it definitely does block the line of sight, the mailboxes. And like I said, along with the tree, I measured it before I came with a ruler. And it's from one side of the tree to the front of the mailbox is 48 inches. Solid. Blacked off. So I don't know about moving the mailboxes, but. Uh, okay. Uh, I did go uh, up and take a look at the tree. I did pull into the driveway. I'm kind of comparing it to the big honk and maple tree out in front of my house. Uh, and I didn't have any uh, problem feeling uh, confident backing out of the driveway. Uh, and I didn't feel that the uh, tree was overly large. I think it adds to the uh, view, you know, the experience of driving down the street. And uh, I would like to see us keep it. Mr. Killian. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I appreciate the arborist commentary. Thank you. Uh, what I'm hearing, though, is a resident who's lived at a home in town for half a century, and apparently this has been uh, quite a concern uh, for this citizen and, and the family because it's come up time and time again over the years. And uh, you know, uh, as as a as a resident in that home for 45 years, if Mr. Frankenstein says that it is obstructing his view in an unsafe way, then uh, that's good enough for me, and I, I will take his word at that. So while I'm not a fan of, of cutting down a healthy tree, uh, you know, to put tree health above human health in, in this case, if, if we don't heed our citizens' concern uh, about safety and, and something should happen in the future, I, I think that we will regret uh, not uh, taking that concern at face value. So I think it's not a lot for a longtime citizen and taxpayer with this type of concern to, to come to us, and then I will support uh, the, the Frickenstein's request. Any comment, Ms. Watson? I just, uh, what will go up if it gets removed? Will another tree be planted, or will it just be gone? What would go in its place? Mm -hmm. I guess that would be Mr. Sims. Um, I Call. believe you spoke earlier you would prefer not to have a replacement, exactly. correct? Yes. Okay. Because I have an ash tree within 10 feet of the sidewalk already, and it, it's that big, okay? Off to the, to, towards the neighbor's area there, but uh, it's not anywhere near the, in line of sight of the uh, sidewalk or the backing out of the driveway. And I'll qualify that for Ms. Watson. Um, it, it is standard practice for us if a, if a resident chooses to not have a tree um, in their boulevard for, for whatever reason, uh, provided there's not one there already, um, but we don't have any issue finding another home for it. Uh, we have roughly 1,600 vacant locations in town that we can fill, so uh, it wouldn't be a matter of canopy coverage if that's your question. One thought would be if you're counting on that ash tree, I don't think it's going to be here in a couple of years. So it may be. Yeah, that's an issue, Mr. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, well, I'm not a, a big fan of removing uh, uh, mature, uh, healthy trees from our streetscapes. Uh, you know, one of the big jobs we've had here since I've been on this committee is is protecting them, um, and uh, and we've. You know, done the studies on you know the, the relative value they bring to the community, uh, to a neighborhood, you know, and we do know that removing trees uh, can be heartbreaking for people in the neighborhood. We just had a, a, a large-scale removal on Kickbush Street because of street reconstruction, um, and boy, did I get some comments from people on that. They are just you know heartbroken. So they've lived there also for decades and decades, and their their street has dramatically changed. Um, a lot of it was ash, some of it was because of unhealthy trees and, and whatnot, but the end result was a kind of a war zone there, and now, you know, some smaller trees will be in their stead. Uh, so it is really our job to uh, uh, preserve our canopy throughout the city. It, it's, uh, it adds a lot to the beauty uh, and charm of the city. You know, looking at the photos supplied, and thank you for providing those in the, in the packet, you know, the, the mailboxes do bother me way more than the tree. Uh, before I even get to that, I mean, the positioning of this tree is essentially uh, replicated how many thousands of times throughout the city? Thousands. 
uh, trees of this size, um, and trees in that basic location, you know, off the curb and off of a driveway. Uh, we have trees, trees, you know, flanking our driveway at our house. Uh, you're going to find, and I can see right down the street, another one. Um, so I, I don't see the inherent danger there when we've got it replicated thousand times over uh, within the city's limits. Um, but, you know, we have a mailbox on our house, not out at the curb. And I can just tell from this one photo with the parked car down the street, and uh, it is good to, to bear in mind that there's parking on both sides of the street there. So that first, you know, six feet or so of road is not really, you know, for driving, it's for parking. Uh, you can be pretty far out into the road before you've made a decision to back into the street um, because there should be nobody driving along the curb. But I see those uh, mailboxes right about at your eye level with regards to that car that's parked down the street. Um, I, I think that a whole lot of your, your concerns would be allayed by getting those boxes out of there and putting them somewhere where they do not preve uh, pre uh, present a, a visual hazard, like they obviously do. Uh, and the tree, it's far enough off the street and far enough off the uh, driveway to me, as a, as, a, as a driver, I think I would be able to work my way, look around this side of it, then get past it, and look at that side of it before I went fully into the street. I just, I don't, I don't see that this is a, a dire need, but uh, a high priority would be moving those mailboxes out of there. And I don't know if the city would help in that endeavor as a good, uh, you know, show of, of support for, uh, for the citizen. Uh, and I would cer certainly support that. Uh, but that, I don't really support uh, killing a good tree like this. I would like to see the speed limit on our street enforced. 600 cars a day, and many are over. There, I bet you there isn't even one-tenth of the cars that go 25 miles an hour or less. Yeah, I get that, uh, and that same concern voiced like in our neighborhood too, like on... Uh, on Stark Street, it's just a thoroughfare. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Don't we have any enforcement left? I well, mean, what... it's it's hard to enforce every neighborhood because you know, you know our our police department would be stretched pretty thin, I suppose. Um, but it is a it's a concern. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you put up the the uh, uh, the radar sign and try and get people to be aware or whatever, and they, people do what they do, and you catch them when you can. But nobody shows up to enforce the radar. That's the thing. Um, Mr. Larson? When Mr. Hardwell With all due respect, sir, that's a topic for another day, the speed, and because be. Be uh, this is a Parks topic, and Rec right? meeting. I mean, I have neighborhoods in my district as well where I have a speeding problem. But I have to agree with, with uh, Mr. Neal that I, I believe that first, before we take down a good tree, we should probably move those mailboxes and see if that doesn't cure your problem. Is there a motion on whether to uh, grant or not grant this tree removal request? It has to be in the positives. Okay, so I would ask for, for the purposes of bringing this to a vote, would there be a motion uh, made to uh, grant the request to remove the tree? Mr. Killian moved. Second. One more time, second to remove the tree. Hearing none, motion failed, and the tree stays, apparently. And I'm not sure about, um, has the parks and forestry ever gone over with a couple of guys and moved mailboxes in concert with property owners? That may be a first for us. <laughs> okay. uh, Madam Mayor, perhaps uh, this is something that we can, you know, look at, you know, offline and and see if uh, uh, Public Works can't help with repositioning that from a safety uh, perspective. Is that be a record about the speeding on our street? That, that will be in the minutes. We'll make sure it's in the minutes. Uh... It'll be part of the meeting record if you would like uh, to contact the police department. Yes. Uh, you can certainly do that as well. Very good, thank you. Okay, got that one out of the way. Um, 
Discussion on possible action requesting funds for an environmental consultant to prepare recommendations to test the waters of the Wisconsin River. Uh, hashed this over uh, pretty thoroughly last time, uh, and after the meeting, a couple of days, I got a call at home from uh, Kevin Fable, our environmental engineer, and he said that he wished he had been in the room because he could have informed us that we would not be allowed to uh, disturb the uh, river bottom uh, and that we shouldn't even consider that, that if we wanted to consider testing, uh, that we should just test the water. And I uh, told him that my imagined scenario for this would be as simple as a couple of guys in a canoe, one with a couple of uh, clean water bottles, and get above Riverview Park and then below Thomas Street Bridge, and Kevin laughed and said, that's about what you'd need. Uh, but I think we would uh, want uh, professional advice on what to test for, uh, in addition to pentachlorophenol. Um, and how many tests it take. I mean, you could do two, you could do six, you could, you know, whatever. Uh, thoughts of the committee? Mr. Killian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a, uh, a few thoughts uh, from different facets. And uh, one is I, I'm, uh, you know, I appreciate Mr. Fable's input, but I do believe that if we were to coordinate uh, our uh, desire and plan with the Department of Natural Resources that I think uh, we may be uh, surprised that uh, they would assist us and if, if our desire was to take some fairly benign sediment samples. So I, I think uh, we, should, uh, we should wait and, and, and talk to the DNR, communicate with the DNR about that uh, because I think that, uh, and I brought some information tonight, that just taking surface water water samples, as you described, would likely be uh, of little benefit, and, uh, and we would be send it, uh, spending city funds to do it. And currently, we have a few higher priority uh, environmental issues in, in that part of town that we're going to be spending uh, city funds on, although we don't know how much yet. But uh, I'd like to, I, I brought, and I can pass out, uh, may I pass out copies, Mr. Chair? Sure. Uh, so, and we'll just pass that down here. I brought, uh, there should be enough for everybody. So, in 1989, uh, the uh, Department of Health Services, ironically, uh, the state toxicologist, they had, uh, they had assessed the health assessment of, uh, of the consultant that the uh, polluter, we could uh, be a little more subtle and call them the responsible party that, that they had hired. Uh, that consultant was Keystone, actually a subsidiary of the chemical company that made the Penta. Uh, but if you'll see uh, under number nine, the state says that the elimination of dioxins and ferons from direct contact exposure uh, to the river should not be done. It goes on to state dioxins, ferons were found in the river water in 1986. The fact that they were not found in 1987 is probably an only uh, an annual or detection variation and should not be evidence to remove them from exposure considerations. So essentially, if I'm not uh, misinterpreting the state toxicologist commentary, there are annual uh, variations, and I, I would think even uh, within any given year, there are going to be variations in current and groundwater and so forth. So uh, I do see value in, in testing uh, the sediment because that will accumulate over time, but just a one-off surface water uh, testing, and especially as you described, I, I think would have minimal value, and yes, there are parameters uh, to make it statistically significant if you're going to be testing the surface water. And uh, then uh, I brought two other uh, pieces of documentation. Uh, I can just pass those down. And uh, what I did is I, so we, we talked about at the prior meeting that uh, there had been a uh, Supreme Court decision about groundwater uh, entering waterways through the subsurface. And what I had done in between meetings is I had contacted the DNR to see if uh, 
to see if uh, this might, uh, thank you, this might be uh, applicable now that this court decision was made. And I'd like to uh, read uh, one statement from uh, Mr. Roseboom's email that he sent to me. Although the water quality program determined that it does not have the authority to require a permit for this specific discharge, the remediation and redevelopment program still does not consider the ongoing discharge to the Wisconsin River to be acceptable. And then it goes on to say that is why continued remedial action is required and that there'll be some other uh, remedial action options discussed in the future. But uh, in the last, and uh, I'm sorry I've had to do it in, in this way, the last, uh, <laughs> thank you, Ms. Pollitt, uh, the last document, and, and this is, I think, what should be a, a priority for our committee here. Ironically, the, the last document I'm sharing is from the state, it, written in 1988. And we just saw that in 2020, the DNR said it does not find this discharge into our river to be acceptable. And in 1988, it says, the third area of concern we discussed dealt with interim actions that the department would like implemented to stop the discharge of pentachlorophenol and dioxin or furon compounds to the Wisconsin River. Okay, so 32 years ago, it wasn't acceptable then. In 2020, it's not acceptable now, but what's been done about it? So what I did is I asked the city attorney's office if they could research uh, this new Supreme Court decision, because I understand it's quite recent and that, uh, you know, even environmental attorneys, uh, it may be fairly new to. So I guess what I'd like to see before we pursue anything like this is if we have any recourse as a city to make sure the Federal Clean Water Act is rigorously enforced, even if the state DNR would not enforce it in such a way. Now that would take uh, legitimate legal recourse and perhaps the DNR is right that there is no authority uh, that will make Eco seek out a permit, but let's let the city attorney's office look at that, I think. Perhaps the polluter or the responsible party would have to pay for testing the, the water. And, uh, you know, I think we've, uh, Waleco and Century Insurance has cost this community enough fiscally and otherwise, so I'd like to look into that, and I would move to table this until we know. Thank you. Is there a second on the motion to table? Ms. Watson, second. Is there a discussion on that, or we have to? I don't know my parley pro. Not no. Uh, have we had a second? Yeah. Oh, we did. Um, not sure. I, I'm, I'm understanding the tabling. You know, until when uh, to determine exactly what. You know, we uh, as as the staff letter indicates. You know, uh, any testing of sediment in the in the river is really a no go. It's not something that we can pursue or remediate it's something that just is there and uh, what we're more concerned about from our committee standpoint is the role of the park itself as a conduit if, if that is what it is that's why we've been doing so much testing and looking at the park itself um, beyond the park you know we're getting outside of our purview so we you know the river is really beyond our purview we we don't have any uh, bathing beaches uh, or places where we encourage people to enter the water. Uh, so even if we did a, a, a water testing without sediment and came up you know, relatively clean, I would feel uh, reticent to say to the citizens that, oh yeah, it's fine, go jump in the river and have a good time. That's really not something I would uh, think was a great idea, um, mainly because of the, the sediment and we don't have you know, approved bathing areas along that river. So it, that also is outside of our purview. I think our main thing is to determine uh, through our testing, which we are, have been undergoing and looking at uh, as a source to any potential pollution to the river, determine what that is and to what degree and, and how we can re remediate it. And those are things we're looking at right now. So I think we should stick with that. And, um, stick I just, with I, what? Hmm? Stick with what? What we've been doing with regards to the park. Okay. Uh, and I would not uh, support this uh, waters testing. I don't really see that it's going to gain us anything um, for the two reasons I just mentioned. One, we can't go into the sediment. 
uh, and deal with anything there because that's just that's there and it's going to stay there. Um, and the water itself, this is not something that falls under our purview because we're not, you know, encouraging people to go jump in that water. Uh, it's uh, not recommended. So I'd say we stay the course with what we've been doing with regards to the park itself, determine what our situation is there, uh, determine what our remediation options are there, and, and stay within our turf. Mr. Larson. I agree. I think if we can't test, I, I, I looked at this and I read this uh, letter from Mr. Fable and, and whether or not, if it's legal or not to, to test for sediment, you know, it's there's nothing there. Uh, I mean, there's there's been no research provided to, to say if it's legal or not. It, you know, um, without the sediment testing, it's why even bother at all? Because it's a river. Water's here. It's gone there. You know, you know, you pee in a river. It's done. It's down the river. You know, um, um, I, I I would support the motion because uh, for the simple fact, if um, the responsible parties need to test this, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll let the responsible parties test this water. Um, if we find out that the court decision says, well, legal has it, it has their responsibility to do it, let's do it. Let them do it and uh, let us stick to the parks and I'll support the motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would just say that I feel quite differently uh, than some of the thoughts that we've had. Um, I am a lot more concerned about the water that people come in contact with than whatever may be uh, along the bottom that's not going to be uh, contacted by recreational users. And right now, uh, and I've said this before, but we can say right now that we think that it's okay to recreate in that water, uh, but we don't know it. Uh, I think there's a chance that if we did uh, do the uh, testing that we would find uh, nearly undetectable levels uh, and some of the other concerns uh, that have been raised here today about what, what else we need to do uh, might go away. So I think in order to address public concerns uh, that we should um, get a consultant, find out what the testing uh, regimen would be uh, and go for it. We have money that uh, has been uh, kind of waiting for an opportunity to do something like this in the whole Scrawsy Landfill Fund. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think uh, I'm persuaded by my colleagues' arguments that this shouldn't be tabled and it should just, uh, I just, we'll just intend to vote against it tonight uh, so that also this does not kind of keep reemerging on, on the agenda. If, uh, if I thought that testing a couple ton of surface water samples on the river was going to demonstrate that that was safe, then I, I, would, uh, I would support uh, doing this, but it, it will not. And I think we can clearly see that from the state's commentary in, in their 1989 document. So I would be inclined to withdraw uh, my motion to table and uh, just to bring this uh, for a vote, uh, which I will then, uh, I, I will not support it. Thank you. Okay, if the original motion is gone, that's gone. I would say um, I sense that we're close to voting, but basically I think uh, a vote no on this is to say that we do not want to know what's in that water and a vote yes is that we do want to know what's in that water so um, do we have a motion to approve this mr killian says bring it to a vote may i ask a parliamentary question sir sure uh if i motion uh to approve uh Am I uh, required to vote in the affirmative? Nope. No. Okay. You just, you're being a good citizen <laughs> and bringing it up for discussion so that we can take action on it. Uh, then I will do that. Thank you. Put it out there so I can kill it. Perfectly okay. Is there a second to the motion to approve the concept of getting an environmental consultant? And I think we would not say, you know, two samples, we would say, what should we do in order to uh, properly uh, test the safety of the waters of the Wisconsin River along that stretch? Um, 
Is there a second for that? I'll second it just for the sake of the vote. Very good. Is there any other comments or discussion? Ms. Watson. Um, I think it's slightly unfair to, to do the line drawing that says that if you vote no, you're, you don't care about what's in the water, and if you vote yes, you do. I think it's just whether or not it's a good process and a, a good use of money to test it. So I, I just putting it out there, like. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, and I would just yes, kind of, I don't know, maybe be a little redundant to what I said earlier, but uh, I don't, I, I'm reticent of having uh, this committee you know, if we were to go through some testing uh, for certain items, and we can't test for every element under the, under the sun, um, that not finding significant levels of them that were then encouraging people to go use the river for purposes I don't think it should really be used for. You know, um, uh, the Milwaukee River through, through downtown Milwaukee is recognized as a recreational river, but it's for kayakers and boaters, you know, and some people who like to fish, but I don't know if they want to eat the fish that they catch out of there. It's not intended for a place to go swimming and, you know, with the family. Um, and I think that's the case with uh, a lot of uh, rivers that go through industrialized uh, areas uh, with a history, you know, a long history of industrial use along the water, which was normal. Um, so I, I don't want to come out of this, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, yes, I, I, I want to find out what's in the water. But what's in the water could be from a, a plethora of, of sources, for one thing. Uh, and if we find that uh, we didn't really find a lot of bad things, I don't want to be telling the citizenry that, oh, we've now got a, a perfectly you know, safe river to go jump in because that is not the case. That's just not what it's for. And I find it kind of outside the purview of parks because we don't have the park. The river is not a park. So we're kind of getting, if, if this is a public health and safety committee concern, fine. That, that'd be one thing to look at, but this is not a park issue to begin with, and I'm just concerned about putting out the wrong kind of message. Very good. So we have a motion and a second to go ahead with this. Um, any other comments? All those in favor of uh, requesting funds for an environmental consultant to prepare recommendations to test the waters of the Wisconsin River vote aye. That would be me. All those opposed say aye. nay. Nay. Very good. Vote shall be one to four. Thank you. Um, moving on to item seven, discussion of possible action regarding plowing 3M parking lot during the winter. Uh, Mr. Larson requested that. Maybe can lead us off on the discussion and we can have some comments from Ms. Polly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had some constituents approach me with some park issues and and uh, parking. I believe that's Fifth Avenue um, along that uh, set of that street there. When uh, it becomes a problem when people um, park on the road for sledding, and uh, I, I can see where that be a problem. And and I've been told that it's not a recognized or a, um, an approved. Um, sledding hill but it's used nonetheless and, I, and I've also been told that that well why should we um, plow this this parking lot when when they can just park on the street because the street's not not it's a dead-end street and it's not very well traveled street anyway but I guess um, the, the fact of the matter is 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 the parking lots there there's sledders there and parking on the street creates a problem and, and I believe that we should plow that parking lot. I believe that um, we're looking at a problem that, that we're, that, well, I guess what I'm saying is, is if an emergency vehicle couldn't get down there, then the city might be liable for not, not having that street cleared. You know, um, so I, I'm just saying, uh, do we, I, I know I'm new at this. Do we have parks department plows anyway that go out and plow parks? Uh, can they go in there and take a swipe at that uh, while they're out plowing? That's, that's uh, the request of the neighbors there. Uh, thank you. I believe Ms. Polly has talked to staff about this and has some thoughts. I have. Um, yep, and I did put a, a write-up in your packet as well uh, regarding this. 
Um, we did go back through our call log too just to see if we've had any complaints or issues um, and we have not had any um, in this area so the the park as I put the aerial of the park in there you can see the area is used for sledding um, the roads are plowed by our public works department and then the parking is restrictions that are around the city are also followed you know when they're opposite street parking or no parking um, our parks department does routinely go through this area to knock down the snowbank um, along Fifth Avenue and Park uh, Boulevard, I think it is, to because they know people do park there for sledding, so that allows people to get out of their car and walk across the snow to the sledding hill. Um, if you see the aerial too, the parking lot is quite a distance away from where they actually sled. So people park where they can walk the, the least um, to get to where they want to go. So we just have not seen the need or the usage. I mean, we go through very periodically to remove that snowbank, um, and it all depends on the amount of snow that we get. Um, we have not had any requests for plowing that parking lot or any calls that, that that's an issue. Um, so from our staff's perspective, it's been working the way that it's been working with us, removing some of the snow to allow the people to get easily from their car to the sledding hill um, in that shortest distance that they want, and um, the need just hasn't shown um, the staff time needed to plow that parking lot. Mr. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you know, at, at first blush, you know, I, I felt, uh, no, this doesn't really fall under the, you know, we need it kind of category, um, and that the you know it's not really in the budget. It's not on the routes. You know, it's not something that you know, uh, we've allotted manpower and, and money to add to our, our workload. Uh, so my my first in inclination was to say you no. Know, uh, one thing I will throw out there though, uh, this might be considered an asset uh, to help alleviate some of the on street parking during the winter, which has been something that. Uh, uh, is of some concern and you know we've taken it up in the, the SISM committee on more than one occasion and we'll continue to deal with you know getting people to not park on the street so that we can easily clear snow from the streets uh, during uh, heavy snow uh, falls. So uh, maybe uh, Public Works and SISM can take a look at that in terms of alleviating street parking rather than as a convenience for sledders families. Uh, so that, that's how I would probably like to maybe pass the ball off to where it might be fulfilling a more uh, uh, salient purpose uh, for the neighborhood and for the city and, and for uh, the street crews. So just throwing it out there, you know, if, if uh, in our neighborhood, let's say, um, there was an asset like this that could be plowed and it would help alleviate some of the on-street parking during snow emergencies, that would be a, that would be a plus. So. Something to look for, look at maybe by SISM and uh, uh, Public Works. Would you like to refer it to that committee? I would move to refer this to SISM. Okay, Ms. Polly. Um, I have one recommendation that we talked about as staff um, that I should have mentioned earlier too is, is you know we would be very open to taking a look at it throughout this year, um, just because it hasn't been brought to our attention before, and so we don't see it as a need or a problem, but we could. Um, I guess pay closer attention to it this year to see what the usage and the need actually is. And it will also, I mean, it depends on the amount of snow we get, but we can take a conscious look at that as well. It's my feeling that it's entirely possible that um, four or five families might come down that street to park for sledding. At the same time, you know, there could be, you know, seven or eight or nine uh, neighbors who park on the street just as a matter of course. Uh, and we might be able to take care of all of those in one fell swoop. So. so the motion is to refer it to SISM? Is there a second to that? Second on the motion to refer to SISM. Is Watson? Any discussion? I kind of like the idea of uh, taking the uh, concern under advisement and uh, I would certainly be willing to put this on our agenda for next July uh, or something and uh, finding out you know what we've observed over the winter now that we kind of 
thinking about this concept, but um, either way works. Uh, clearing that lot in order to possibly help the present. So uh, I would uh, support, I think, Alder Larson's sentiment on that. Thank you. So uh, if you were to make a motion, it would be your sentiment is to have ask the Park Department to do a trial uh, clearing of the lot for this winter. That's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay, so Ms. Watson, sorry. Um, so do we have like sort of a guesstimate on cost or with, you know, everything that sort of happened with like field events and that kind of thing, is there some pile of money that you can throw at this to help with clearing? Um, right now we don't have anything budgeted for it, no, so it would be an additional cost. And as I put in there, you know, based on our, our snow removal routes now, this would be, I mean, if it would have to be added to our schedule, it would be on the very bottom of the priority because the usage just hasn't showed that it's necessary. You said you put something in the packet. What page is that? No, I just put the aerial of oh, the okay. park so it, you can see how far. I mean, it's not close to the sledding hill, so it's it's not. Even if we plow the parking lot, I still and we'll, we can watch it and, and see, but I still feel that people are going to park on the street unless they are told they can't um, and it's enforced, but they're going to park where it's closest to get to the sledding hill. And has there ever been like history of, of um, like plowing those sidewalks? There is not sidewalks no on the side there. on the street, so there's no it sidewalks looks like or there's trail. sidewalks within the park though. From the parking lot. There's a walkway. There's a walkway, but it doesn't go all the way to the sledding hill. And those no, are not over. those are not plowed in the winter, no. Okay, but I mean they're they're paved. They're paved, but yeah, but they're not plowed. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I have a motion with a second to refer this to SISM. Uh, any other discussion on that, or we can vote on that and perhaps move on to a different motion. All those in favor of referring this to CISM with a request that they uh, plow the lot uh, and free up some uh, street parking for the winter, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Nay. Nay. Okay. That goes down four to one, right? One to four. Um, is there another motion uh, to either uh, take it under advisements for the year or plow it for the year? I'll make the motion to, uh, to plow it for the year and, and see how it goes. Okay, and then we would evaluate? We would evaluate uh, it after this year, correct, sir? Okay, second to that. Very good. Any discussion on that? Uh, yeah, I just would throw in that um, this would be, you know, well, as Director Polly stated, uh, really far down uh, on the priority list, so I, I doubt that it will ever get budgeted anyways, uh, regardless of what, how we vote tonight. Um, and not only that, but from a propriety standpoint, we're talking about plowing uh, a, a park area so that people can use a non-park area, essentially, or a you know, non-sledding hill. I mean, it's not a designated sledding hill, right? Correct. We, yeah. Well, it's a recognized, I mean, I don't know if we've got a sign sled here, but yeah. mm -hmm. they certainly use it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's I get, you know, more of a neighborhood tradition than anything else. You know, like we have one next to Tom Field. Yeah. And at any given time, you know, there's four or five cars down there and, you know, yeah. a, a dozen think, kids up and down the, the yeah. hill because, you know, a lot of them walk there from, you know, the neighborhood. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm just, uh, I, I don't support this. Uh, you know, budgetarily, it's a non-starter anyways. And, uh, you know, I, I just, the only reason I could support it is if, if we figured uh, the, the city could look at it as a, a mitigating thing for street parking in winter. Okay. I would imagine that uh, if the motion to do this on a trial, if this were to fail, that we could still uh, expect that the staff would uh, watch the situation and we would be able to reevaluate in a year. Um, okay, any other comments? We have a motion to uh, ask the Park Department staff on a trial basis for one year to, uh, as time allows, uh, send a snowplow over there and clear that lot. All those in favor say aye. 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 How many we got? Can we have hands? 
three. Very good. Uh, all those opposed say nay. That's two. So it passes three to two. Very good. And we are into educational items with Dog Park Special Committee, uh, et cetera. Okay. Take it away. Yes, I can give an update. Um, the meeting that was supposed to be tonight um, is postponed just to be able to get some of the signage back that they wanted to review. Um, and that's their big item that they're going to discuss at their next meeting is the, the basic signage that's out there. Um, if you've gone past the site, you'll see that there has been work done on it. Our department graded the parking lot and then the um, city engineering worked with the water department to install the water line. So that's been installed. Now we'll be working on the final grades to the parking lot and um, our department will be installing the concrete entrance pad and Public Works is coordinating the concrete curbing and sidewalk as well as the paving of the parking lot. So I don't have an exact date on those um, items yet, but we are moving along and we're keeping it moving. Um, we did confirm with the DNR this week that um, by removing a bit of that cap for that parking lot, we were still staying within conformance. That was questions brought up this week. Um, we are, I did get confirmation that as long as we pave it, there is no requirement for the, the full cap on it, um, as long as there's the pavement and concrete on it. So that will be taken care of. Um, we will be readjusting the fencing because um, we, we have been told that that, if it goes down more than the two feet, it needs to be completely outside the cap. So I'm just getting a revised um, plan on what that will be. But in talking with um, Mr. Thompson from the DNR, originally in our fencing company, they were not too concerned with the fencing, so we'll just make sure we make that adjustment. That was scheduled to be done um, as soon as the concrete entrance pad goes in, because then we'll drive that fence through that concrete there. So progress is being made. Um, Are we going to have dogs on that park this fall? I, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're working with all different departments. It's kind of a... We don't have one contractor doing it all, but we are Please. keeping it going, so okay. we're trying. But that's where we're at with the dog park. So they will meet on the 18th is when we rescheduled it for. Two Any weeks. questions or discussion on dog park? Very good. Proceed. Okay. Um, project updates. We've even though we have you know not as much going on this summer, we still have a lot going on. Uh, we are still installing the playground at Pleasant View Park. We had some parts that were wrong, so that's what's taking us a little bit longer there. And then um, we'll be doing a recognition of that park opening because we had a donor uh, donate $20,000 towards that park, so we'll do something to recognize that donor as well. Um, Athletic Park and City Ball Diamonds, uh, they're being groomed and prepped daily for the usage by the, the uh, Woodchucks and our youth baseball. Uh, Oak Island Park, if you haven't been down there yet, you can see that playground has been completed and is open to the public. Uh, we do still have to fix and complete the trail that goes up to the playground, and then the orange fencing is still around it um, just to keep the uh, users off of the grass that we seeded, but the entrance is open. And the grass is actually coming in really well, having only been there for three weeks, so that fence has helped. Um, we'll get that down as soon as we feel the, the establishment is, is good enough. Um, Forest Park, uh, electrical service and meter are installed for a lighting that was part of the playground re, um, refurbishing there at Forest Park is a, a big request was a light because it's so dark with those trees there. So lights been put in. The playground equipment was delivered last week Tuesday. So as soon as we finish Pleasant View, um, then we will start Forest Park. Um, Yonkey Park, we install a new water line for the fountain and it's metered so it will go on and off during the day or be on during the day be off at night not running constantly like it used to be also if you haven't walked past it as you leave tonight you can see how shiny it is we had it clean um, from the same company that's cleaning the side of the y and it's it's a big difference it looks really nice so that was completed and uh, then we're just doing regular routine operations and programs uh, mowing eab treatment continues as weather um, allows it to and then tree plantings. Um, we still do have some shelter reservations and a few special events um, that we are accommodating in the parks. We send them information about safety precautions and social distancing. We will be getting signage up in our shelters this week with the information on the governor's order because those are specifically called out in the order as open park shelters um, that have to be 
they're part of the mask requirement. And then we continue to clean our restrooms and everything daily um, to stay with the COVID guidelines. And that's all I have for the park updates. Very good. And Riverside Park testing, uh, we just got a uh, message today that the uh, actual soil tests uh, they are going to be pulled there will be uh, Wednesday morning. So imagine a little luck maybe in a month we'll uh, have the results back from that. Um, JoJo's Jungle, you want to talk about that? Pardon, Mr. Chair. Yes, I have, sir. I have something on Riverside Park. Very good. Um, wasn't there prior testing done on that already that the DNR had already issued us to, that we needed to clean up on? Mr. Killian, can you, Alder Killian, can you clarify that? Well, there was a... There was by the railroad tracks, right? Yeah, there was a... They did a number of tests and they found an exceedance where the exceedances well, were. Wasn't that over said, by where that culvert was too that the DNR said that we needed to to clean up. That's the area of interest that they're saying, okay, we've got one spot, how big is the spot? And that's the, what they're trying to figure out now is the... Okay, okay. And Mr. Killian can probably explain that better than I can. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, essentially, uh, yes, uh, the exceedance or exceedance is found uh, over by the culvert area in the park. Uh, they're doing another round on, on Wednesday to kind of delineate the, ex the extent of that area, both vertically, they're going to test uh, down depth wise too to see how far that goes and then kind of laterally to see how wide that area is by the culvert. And I think, you know, once they know that, I, I, I think that they're going to perhaps talk about remedial options for the area they define. That's, that's kind of what I heard. Thank you. Yeah. So we know we have a problem. We just want to find out where the problem is, how big it is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alder Killian. Very good. Anything, anything else on that? No. Okay. And we can go to JoJo's Jungle, which was quite grand and I'm assuming is getting good traffic. Yes. So after five years um, in the process, uh, Patrick Corder and his family um, completed and got to see JoJo's Jungle opened last week, Thursday. Um, they had a grand opening for the donors at 1 p.m. and then a smaller one for the public at 3 p.m. Um, we tried to do that to spread out the crowd that was there just based on the current situation. Um, but the park and the playground, well the playground, the park's always been open, the playground is open um, and available for the public to, to use and enjoy and um, it's been very, very busy but it's a wonderful project. Uh, we hope to get a little press release out about it, just about the efforts that the Herder family made and the gracious donations of the community and the Community Foundation and, and the Greenheck uh, Foundation and all the other ones that put money towards that project. Um, it's a really great asset to have in the community and a playground we don't have anywhere else. So uh, take a look at it, go out there, make sure that you um, still maintain your social distancing and wear your mask while you're out there, but it is open. Uh, for use. We have just a few minor things that we're working. Um, like any playground, we work with the manufacturers if we find little things and they're coming back to make some adjustments, but nothing that um, causes the, any portion of the playground to be closed at this time. The water features are not in play though, right? Correct. The water features are off for this year um, based on the decision of the, the city to not turn on our fountains at the 400 block or the river life as well as the splash pad and the pools um, and the amount, the, the fact that social distancing when talking at the health department is very hard to maintain in water features. We did turn it on for one hour for the donors to see um, what it was and you could very well see by just the two families that were there, who was the Horder family and then the, the Isaacs family who is that it's named after that the kids were on top of each other. So we're, we are keeping it closed for the rest yeah. of this year. We'll have it on next year. There are some adjustments that need to be made with some drainage anyway, so it's something that has to be um, done before we can open it. Yeah, that'll be, the whole thing is terrific. Uh, we can be very uh, full of gratitude for that project. Um, any other comments on that or mm -hmm. thoughts on future agenda items that you know right now? You obviously, uh, 
within the next three weeks. Let us know if you have something else. Um, next meeting date, we've got figured. Um, so a motion to adjourn would be in order. Mr. Neal and Mr. Kelly and all those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you very much and good night.